happened? Because you retired last year, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, like, have you? Do you have all your paperwork in there, everything, or can you still go and play? Uh, I think it's all in, but like, it's not like you get something back. Like, I don't know. It's not like <laughs> you would think it would be like this super like okay, like you're gonna turn your card in that says you're a player, and yeah, it's not really like that. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's like lost in the paper in the mail or what, but uh, yeah, as far as I know, yeah, I'm I've, always, I've always wondered how that worked because the only other um, professional baseball we player we talked to is Lane Adams, and he's still playing. So oh was, yeah, yeah. So I was like, I can't ask you about how retirement works. Yeah, you're, you're up in Seattle now, right? Yep, yep. Uh, we're gonna appear in Driveline, uh, so. They're, they're in camp, but yeah. Okay, I have plenty of questions about those guys. They're pretty oh, interesting. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, well, and your career has I been have, interesting. Yeah, I have lots of questions about them most days, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just – I didn't hear to them until uh, Trevor Bauer got really involved with them and stuff. Yeah, yeah, they were, uh, like, big towards the end of my career. Uh, and then I actually went up there and trained for a bit, uh, trying to make, like, a comeback and just wasn't able to figure it out with all the new rule changes. But, yeah, it was, like – pretty cool like little little company so yeah baseball is definitely it's been it's been interesting to watch this year for bullpen pitchers because you have guys uh who come in normally just face a lefty or righty and now they have to get no shot yeah yeah you gotta face there you gotta face three batters now and you have no idea well you usually know who you're facing but somebody could be a statistical nightmare for you Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I, I was kind of surprised we didn't see more guys, like, just, like, calling in to driveline and be like, hey, listen, I need to develop, like, a splitty or a changeup now because I got to get the opposite hand to hit her out, like, tomorrow. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm sure we're going to see more of that. Like, guys just, like, especially lefty specialists, like, you got to be able to go out there and get some guys out. Like, like it doesn't matter left-handed, right-handed as much. So that, that kind of takes away some of their leverage, but. No, yeah. definitely, and it and it's interesting. Like, are we out of the age of seeing like the traditional closer? Like, I wonder like how bullpens are going to be going from this point on. Yeah, I think it's just going to be guys that can get opposite handed hitters out consistently. I, I mean, they're still going to be at a premium, but they've always been at a premium. But yeah, uh, like you said, I think you might see a little bit more of closer by committee. Uh, yeah. Like, like, like you have a closer A and a closer B. Closer A goes on nights where lefties are stacked, and closer B goes on nights where righties are stacked. You know. I hope the Mariners find a closer. I'm a diehard Mariner fan, so that's how oh, I became yeah. a fan of yours. Like, yeah, Brad Carey, diehard. This is all Mariner autos. So, oh yeah. Because I live up in Portland, down in Portland, so yeah, three yeah. hours away. So nice, oh, yeah, little, no. nice little good. drive up. You usually catch like two or three games a year. So yeah. it's, it's been weird not being able to go watch baseball. And then um, I'm already recording. Before I do the intro, I do have to let you know I have a brain disorder. So um, it's kind of okay. like Tourette's. I do drop, like, inappropriate words. Um, <laughs> one of them is the N-word. We haven't ever had it happen during recording or anything. It usually, like, happens more when, like, I'm around my mom for some reason. But I do, like, like fuck, weird shit will come out. Um, if you laugh, I won't get mad at you. Um, okay. I also, yeah, yeah, no worries. I also tick a bunch, so like if you start laughing, I like lose concentration. Like I get it's distracting. I laugh at myself because I have to look at myself, and I'm like, "Gosh, you look funny as hell." <laughs> yeah, no worries. No, it'll be good. All right, I'm gonna hit the intro, and then we'll get more into it. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to Just Mitchin. I'm the one and only Mitch Mitchy. We have a very special cat uh, guest. I'm going to redo that one. Oh, 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 oh. Luckily, I have somebody who can edit these. Normally, I have our uh, my other um, friend, uh, the co- our co-host, A, but he um, he changes like his availability on me at like the last minute. That's why I switched it from today, yesterday to the, uh, tomorrow to today. And he's uh, like, oh, I still can't do it. And I'm like, whatever. I was like, I- I'll do the interviews, and then you can just come on and do our live shows. <laughs> yeah. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Just Mitchin. I'm the one and only Mitch Mitchie. I'm here with a former Major League pitcher, Carter Caps. How you doing, brother? Uh, doing great. I appreciate you having me on. Oh, no. Thanks for coming on, man. Like, this is this is awesome. I love love talking baseball. It's my fa- Even though I'm, like, decked out in Packers gear right now, it's my favorite <laughs> sport, man. There's nothing like it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like I said, uh, I've seen a lot of baseball games in my life, and I feel like I've never watched the same game twice. So uh, definitely always something unique, and uh, I think unique probably sums up me pretty well. So Yeah, uh, the, yeah. The extremely unique. You probably, you have my favorite windup in Major League like history, baseball history. 
I'm going to ask you later on how that came about. Cause it's, it's so unique. And you probably get asked that question a thousand times a day. Like, Oh yeah. Come up yeah. with that. <laughs> but starting off is um, something, I mean, I'm left-handed, you're right-handed, but you grew up as a catcher right before you became a pitcher, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I started, uh, I, I caught my whole life and then uh, start, I pitched very briefly in high school, just as needed basis. Uh, and then really started pitching my, uh, I redshirted my first year of college, but my second year of college, I, uh, I was pitcher only after that. And uh, just kind of saw like instant results with it, which was great. But uh, yeah, it was catcher, catcher for a while. You went to Mount all of D2 school, right? Yes, I did. Okay. Where, where is that located? I forgot to look that up. Yep, that's uh, in Mount Olive, North Carolina. Yeah, All right, because so, you're from North Carolina, right? Yeah, yeah, from North Carolina. Ah, you and Seeger. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge Kyle Seeger fan. Oh, okay. Yeah, you got to play with him for a year or two, right? Yeah, yeah, I played with him for a couple years. Yeah, he, him, he seems uh, like a fun guy. Yeah, yeah, no, he's a good dude. Uh, he's a very nice guy. So, uh, like I said, uh, I was kind of just at the start of his career. Like, I think he'd had, like, a year before me, he got called up. But, uh, yeah, so he's kind of – breaking into the league at the same time yeah it'll be interesting to see um how much longer he has because he's kind of well on that mariners team he's kind of getting up there in age he's the old man yeah yeah as far as uh their team and he's definitely the only guy left that i played with uh on that team yeah, uh, there, yeah there's been a ton of turnover but yeah no he's uh it's ridiculous yeah <laughs> i joke like i don't even buy like buy a, a player's jersey anymore because i don't know if they're gonna get traded or not oh yeah yeah, I'm all about, like, I get on eBay and I find, like, either, like, because I'm, I'm pretty much, I'm a big jersey wearer. I think, I have one game worn, and it's, uh, was he around your time? I can't remember his first name. It's Medea, number oh, third. Yeah. Medina or Medea? M-E-D-I-N-A, like, number 37, 36. Yeah, Jorvis Medina. Yeah, yeah. I, so I have his game worn spring training jersey. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I play with him. He's a good dude. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. I, I, mean, play, I actually play with him in double A and in the big leagues. Yeah. Oh, awesome. See, that's cool because I've been trying to figure out, like, who this guy is. I found him on eBay, and I, I'm a bigger dude, so I'm looking for, like, a 54, 52, and it pops up. Oh. I'm like, oh, that's perfect. I'll take it. Oh, yeah, no, he, he's a big boy. Yeah, he's a big boy. <laughs> well, it's funny you get, like, because athletes are, all, you know, in shape and, like, athletic bodies. You see some of these guys are, like, 6'4", and they wear a size 46 jersey. Like, how do you oh. fit in that? Oh yeah, I'm like I I haven't been able to wear like a medium since I was like ten. Oh yeah, yeah, and then we have the uh, majestic lady, or we did have the majestic lady. I guess that now they're Nike, but uh, we had the majestic lady come in uh, every year in spring training, and yeah, they sized you up in the shoulders, and like I kept getting them always to taper my waist. It was like taper more taper, and uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. They actually like they're pretty well fit, honestly for. For a jersey i mean it's almost like a suit fit so, yeah it's yeah. pretty tight like i wasn't expecting it to like be so tight in the stomach and i mean i'm losing weight but i like and i noticed that when i dropped some weight i was like oh it fits a little bit better today yeah <laughs> um funny. so you so i grew up as a catcher too um i'm a but i was weird i'm a left-handed catcher so like from yeah. third grade to like freshman year they're like you can't catch anymore you're gonna start pitching i did not like pitching. I mean, I um, saw results right away. I threw very hard, and that ended up costing me Tommy Johns my senior year. Uh -huh. It's totally sucked because that cost me going to college and all that fun stuff. But um, did did jumping from my catcher to pitcher? Did you enjoy that the same amount because you always had the ball in your hand? Like that's the only thing <laughs> I enjoyed about it was I always still had the ball in my hand. Yeah, yeah, I really liked uh, that aspect of it. I didn't like the not playing every day aspect. That was always hard for me to adjust to. Uh, so it definitely, like, was hard for me to get into, like, a routine at first because, like, I, you know, go catch every game, like, or, or catch, you know, three out of five games or whatever. But, yeah, it was just weird not, like, sitting on the bench and it's like, oh, man, this really sucks. Like, I, I want to be out there playing, like, but uh, understanding the process of, okay, like, no, I only do my field work once a week, but my other four to five days is, you know, in the weight room or like a midweek bullpen or like there's still stuff I can get better at. It's just away from the game and then I come back to the game. So I, I think that took a little bit of getting used to for sure. Yeah, it's a completely different like way of thinking about the game as well. Oh, yeah. um, do you wish that like you could have been a catcher at the big league level or at the professional level? Uh, well, as a career 500 hitter, you know, I probably would have been in the Hall of Fame. But uh, no, <laughs> no, uh, I think uh, I definitely made a good choice. Uh, me and my uh, college coach made a good choice. Uh, Did you get your hits off of? 
sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, Edwin Jackson. Sorry, Edwin. Yeah. <laughs> the guy who played for everybody. Yes. And the nicest human. He's like one of the nicest human beings. Like super nice guy. I played with him like on the same team in San Diego. Like, sorry, I got to hit off you that one time. <laughs> but uh, thanks. I appreciate it. That's yeah. funny. Uh, sorry, my dog's barking. I think my mom oh, just yeah. got home. But we have a big old Great Dane. She's, she's super loud. <laughs> um are you a dog guy cat guy what kind of pet you got uh no definitely not i mean i like cats fine but definitely a dog i got uh three right now so what yeah. do you have uh so we have one it's like uh we have a lot of chickens too uh so we have uh one that guards the chickens he's called a like, caricachan so he's like uh he's like a bulgarian shepherd type like a really okay old... uh we got a nova scotia duck tolling retriever uh which i use duck hunting sometimes and then uh, uh shih tzu oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> so we got literally large, medium, small, yeah. And then do you do you have a farm out? Like, what do you have a bunch of land out in Washington or? Uh, yeah, we got like, about chickens. Yeah, we got seventeen acres. We got like probably fifty chickens right now. Yeah. So if but you ever so- want some eggs, yeah, yeah, I, I sell eggs on the side. I'm an egg hustler. <laughs> I told you I'm probably one of the more unique people you'll talk to. No, that's awesome. I, I'm not gonna lie. I think. Baseball players are unique, and then you get into, like, pitchers or even more unique people. Yeah. Definitely, like, it takes a unique um, mindset to, like, especially be a bullpen guy. You sit in there, and you're always oh, yeah. waiting. When, when is it going to happen? And that, you probably have had a lot of good conversations in the bullpen. Oh, yeah. I mean, honestly, like, I would never condone this, but we hardly ever, like, <laughs> watch the game. Uh, yeah, so it's like – uh, honestly you can tell like what the guy what inning the guy pitches just by like his personality type a but also like when he starts getting serious uh so like uh, i'm pretty good friends with uh, aj ramo so like for a while he was closing i was setting up and uh like so i would get like way more serious an inning before he would get way more serious uh so it's just kind of funny like uh, for me like my routine kind of like fourth inning is like when i start actually like really getting focused and like I get up and start stretching, you know, fifth inning, I get a little bit more mobile, like start doing whatever like makes me move well. And then like sixth, seventh, eighth, like I'm doing like drills and stuff or like, you know, pretty locked in reading the scouting report again, like seeing kind of how the lineup shaking down, like who I'm going to get. Uh, and if I'm going to get an in the game, obviously, but yeah. So like the first, the first one or like, Two innings are like, gosh, I, I I probably have missed more first pitchers than uh, a lot than I've seen. So. <laughs> Did you start in the bullpen, or would you like go in the locker room at first and then come sneak no, yourself into no, the bullpen? No, no. The guys that start in the locker room and then come out are like your your veterans. You're like your okay. savvy. Like you, you bet you better have like some saves racked up if you're gonna do that crap. I mean, yeah, like if you're gonna like sit in the hot tub for seven innings and come out and like get like I'm gonna get a hold for you and then you get the save, like you I'm gonna be pissed if you're in the, the hot tub if you don't have like fifty saves. So because yeah. I know I was listening to Sean Doolittle while I'm talking baseball and he was talking about that, like when he finally thought like he could finally pull that off. And I thought that was such a unique oh, yeah. thing because I, I would be like in the bullpen right away because I like being around the guys. Oh, yeah. You'll, you'll definitely like if you're the guy that is in the clubhouse for like six innings, like you're going to get some crap if you don't like have a serious resume coming out with you. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's frowned upon heavily in the bullpen. Cause I'm trying but to think you were even like the anthem. Like, uh, like if you miss the national anthem, like it's like, okay, like this guy thinks he's something like you better, you need to be out there for the anthem. Like that was always the kind of thing. Like, Hey, like, why are you missing the anthem? You know, you should never miss the anthem. I mean, that's my opinion. I'm, I'm, like a, the- I'm a veteran. So that's yeah. why I say that. Um, cause you were 2012, 2013. So you were there when, um, Francis, when Rodney was there, right? Oh, yeah, I played with Rodney in Miami. Yeah. Okay, in Miami. Dude, yeah. that guy, I can't believe last year he was still pitching at like 43 and bringing heat. Yeah, like no, the, the secret to his success is the sauna. I got into the sauna with him in Miami, and he had that thing at like 120 degrees, I swear. I was like cooking. Yeah, he's definitely uh, – he's an animal. He's an ageless wonder. So, yeah. digressing a little bit back – um. What was I going to say? So coming up through the Mariners organization, you were drafted third overall. Not third overall, in the third round. Well, yeah. I'm getting my, my, my memory all mixed up. In the third round. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was draft day like for you? Like, did you know where you were going to go? Did you have a bunch of workouts? Did you know you're going to Seattle? 
Uh, yes. So I knew none of that. So uh, okay. yeah, for me, uh, I was like, like blue collar family and all that. Like my parents were both working. Like I was literally had my you know computer up and I was like, oh, I might get drafted today. Like I should probably like check in every like 10, 15 minutes. And uh, sure enough, I saw like I had a call or two with my agent like early on in the day. Uh, and, and then, yeah, they were like, hey, I think they're going to take you here in, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And I looked up and sure enough, Seattle Mariners picked me in third round. So yeah, no, it was, it was pretty cool, but it was very like, it wasn't like what you see on TV where like 30 family members are like jumping up and down. And that's like for the like top 20 guys. Yeah, like, top 20 guys. The, the rest of us are just like waiting around. Like, hey, I really would like to go at some point. But Were you in nervous right that day? Uh, no. Cause I mean, I, I was like, uh, at that point I was like, Oh, you know, I'd be happy. Like anywhere I got drafted, like I, I just want a shot kind of thing. Like, cause I went to a small D2 school. Like I said, I had, had started pitching two years prior. I was like, you know, just give me a shot. Like I, I want to go like play. And, and like, luckily the Mariners did that. So I was always like, I'll always be a Mariners fan just for that reason. Man, <laughs> it's brutal to be a Mariners fan sometimes. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. We're going on 20 years of no playoffs. Um, there's this great documentary on YouTube uh, by SB Nation, and they go through, like, the history of the Mariners and, like, how, like, glorious the organization can be and just how bad they can be at the same time. Yeah. And it, it's it's beautiful. But um, you started out in Jackson, right? Uh, so, I, well, originally I basically signed really late in 2011. I uh, went to go play in the Cape Cod League for a bit, eventually, like, settled on an agreement with the Mariners and then I played in Clinton Lumber Kings with my first okay. ever like affiliate and that was low A and I was a starter there and then the next year I started in Jackson as a reliever. Okay. Good. Yeah. So I forgot all about that. Um what's the Cape like? Did summer catch like make that way too crazy? Is the Cape as uh, I don't know. It was really cool. Like it was a very cool environment. Uh like the fields like suck, but you know that going there already. But like the level of talent is unbelievable. I mean, like you're not going to go find better talent unless you go play professionally somewhere. There's like, it's just impossible. Uh, so there's a ton of talent there. And honestly, it's just a really cool experience. Cause it's like very close knit. It's almost like spring training in the sense that like everything's drivable. Okay. Uh, very drivable. But uh, yeah, it's just like a really like that whole Cape Cod community is all very like close knit. And it's just, a really neat experience. I, I, if anybody has an opportunity, I would definitely like encourage them to really pursue that. It, it is, it is awesome. Well, now in your hat, we're seeing more college wood bat leagues kind of pop up. I yeah. just saw the Appalachian league just announced that they're coming up. I mean, out here in Portland, you have the, um, the Northwest league with like the pickles and the gray wolves and all that. So I haven't made it to pickles game yet. I have to go to see um, some college wood bats. I know the talent's still good and it's rich and it's, Amateur ball is fun to watch because they wanted so much more almost. I mean, even in the minor, oh, yeah. like lower minor leagues are still great. Sometimes in the big leagues, you can just tell when a guy's taking, a, taking some time off. Taking a oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, those guys are like hungry. They're scratching. They're right there. And they're like trying to break through. And, and that's kind of the difference, right? Like you got, you know, your established veteran guys who are like, you know, like injury, uh, like adverse almost. They're like, hey, I, I need to like – conserve this hard 90 like I don't need to like spot hit a ball in the dirt and then like run a hard 90 like I need to do that for 162 games and put up 30 home runs like that that, that's my game plan that's not like I'm not trying to get one more hit uh, every month you know yeah it's interesting (laughs) it's it it is interesting uh because you weren't up in the minors that long right yeah no I uh got drafted in 11 and made my debut in 12 so yeah it was and I I think Total, it was a couple months. Yeah. Where'd you make your uh, debut at? Uh, Yankee Stadium. Yeah. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah. uh, you're you at that point. You're just a relief. You, not just a reliever, but you're a relief. you've always been coming out the bullpen, right? Yeah, yeah. But I never like it made a start or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the big leagues, I've always been a reliever. All right, awesome. Yankee Stadium. So who'd you face? Uh, I faced uh, Russell Martin, Curtis Granderson, and Derek Jeter. Oh, gosh, those are all guys who can take you deep in a second. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did yeah. you go one, two, three? No, no, no. I went uh, – I only, like, faced – like, uh, I faced those three guys, and then Oliver Perez came in uh, to, like, relieve me. Uh, yeah, to face some lefties. But, yeah, no, it was just – Perez has an interesting lineup. 
Oh uh, yeah, no, he definitely do, does a lot of like the more of the Quato esque like hesitations and like big like no look quick pitch guy. And yeah, he, he definitely is changed it up a lot of times. Yeah. Jeez, Jeter. I couldn't imagine facing Derek Jeter and Yankee Stadium. Oh yeah. I would have crap myself. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just being a kid of the nineties because we're only two years apart. You're born in nineteen ninety, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 90. I was born in ninety two. So dang. Yeah, Jeter was the man left for us growing up. Uh what oh, yeah. who was your team growing up? Uh I was like the Braves. They're really the closest team to me in North Carolina. So uh, right. yeah, yeah, I like the Braves. Uh, and, and it's like the nineties was kind of when they were like at their peak too. So that helped a lot, obviously, but yeah. Oh yeah. You had, it was dominant. You had Glavin, Schmoltz, um, Andrew Maddox, Jones, Andrew uh, Jones. Chipper Jones. Yeah. Yeah. Larry Wayne. Yeah. I love saying that. It's so great. Even though if I called him Larry Wayne, you might punch me in the face. <laughs> I love how Piazza always says, I can't call a grown man chipper. Oh <laughs> yeah. Because I've been watching a lot of them on baseball on Sunday night baseball and stuff. I think Chipper Jones has done a great job. So is Alex Rodriguez talking about a guy whose career was completely in the dumps and made, made something out of it mm-hmm. with that. So when did the hitch come and play? Like, when did that weird, like, I don't want to see it is weird. I'm sorry. It, when did that weird, like crow hop hitch come into play? Yeah. So that was uh 2015 uh, would be the, the year that started. And it was just, I had like a couple of partial tears in my UCL and was kind of just playing through them. Uh, and it was just really painful to throw, to be honest. And uh, it was just – it was less painful to throw there, and I also was able to keep the velocity up. Uh, so it was basically like the hit started from like wanting to not feel the pain of like throwing a ball. Uh, and then so like my stride is like you have this hitch in your arm, so you have to buy time, right, with the lower half. So like the stride elongates and elongates and elongates, and I, I'm just trying to figure a way out to throw hard. So it's like – as I get into that hip triple extension, like hip extends, knee extends, ankle extends, like I start getting like airborne down the mound uh, and the velocity is still there. So like nobody wants me to change it because like I'm getting guys out because it's really tough to hit off of. So yeah, that was kind of like how that progressed was just honestly just like a couple of tears in the UCL, like a couple of partial tears before I it's ended It's so up uncomfortable. Coming. Oh yeah. That, yeah. That's what I, I partially teared it in like, <laughs> went through life and then I saw a do- saw um, a hand surgery and he's like you need to get that fixed for you to like live more comfortably. Did you finally eventually have to get TJ? Yes, yeah, so I got TJ in uh, 2016 in spring training. I missed like all of 2016. Yeah. It sucks. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't like the whole cast part and then you're like have this robotic arm and then everybody's asking you 50 different questions. Yeah. Um so with the hitch, did your mile per hour go up at all? No, no. Were I, you I still hitting always, triple digits? Uh, yeah, I, I was, you know, I hit 100 before. And then, like, I, I actually would say I probably went down probably just a tick. Uh, I, I was more consistently, like, 99 to 100 before surgery than I was after. Uh, I, I'd say after I was more like 97 to 99. How did you like, feel the first time you hit, like, those high 90s? Because in college you were mostly, like, low to mid-90s, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was a starter, so, like, I got definitely gained a few miles an hour in the bullpen. Uh, just f- only to go one inning. A few, like, going those. Is it just because you gassed out more, threw harder? Because I know some guy – it seems like Verlander, if he can throw 98 after eight innings into a ball game, like, yeah. what is he going to do if he did one inning? So, like, how did that work for you? Yeah, for some guys, it's different for everybody. Like, uh, some guys, like, have that, you know, turn it on, like, when a guy gets on and they can, like, coast. And some guys, like, you know, they got to go blow it out the whole way. Like, for me, it was more of, like, a mindset of, you know, I don't have to save anything in the tank. Like, I, I like, because as, as a starter, like, it was my job. Like, I, I want to give it over to the bullpen or go the whole game and get a win. Like, so I want to get put them in a good position to finish off the game. Uh, so it was just kind of a huge mindset change for me. And now it's like, okay, I'm not saving my slider. You know, I'm not saving like my change up or anything like that. Like every batter gets my best stuff and my best fastball. So th- that's where like the mindset changes. It's like, I don't have to like coast. I don't have to like save anything. Like this is my inning Th- this. And uh, you know, sometimes I come in and get seven outs or, or six outs or whatever, but like, those are my innings. Like that's how much I have in the tank and I'm going to blow it out. And like, that's what I, some of the injury risk come from like going as a starter to reliever too. But yeah. And I, I, I just a mindset change. Just balls to the wall. Did um yeah. your whole like 
throwing program change when you went from starter to reliever? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, I, I say I get off the mound more often as a reliever uh, because, like, if I, you know, go two out of three, uh, like, two out of three appearances, uh, th- that would be more often. And also, like, I want the ball more often because I'm not, like, getting out there. I'm not getting a chance to work on anything. Uh, when I go out there, I'm just – like I need results now. Like I, I don't have like a batter to play around with, you know, like, Oh, I'll try and backdoor something here just cause I, I like I, I need to, maybe I need to set him up for a, a bat later in the game. Like I need him out now and I need him out quick, you know, in your face. And when you're coming in the seventh and eighth inning, you're facing some of the top hit- hitters at that point. Oh yeah. yeah oh yeah, hitting. for sure. And, and it's like high leverage situation. So it's like a different like aspect and a uh, guy's like, hitters change their, you know, approach quite a bit later in the game. And if there's runners in scoring position, like if you look at, you know, first pitch swinging, uh, nobody on versus first pitch uh, swinging percentage with, you know, a runner on second or third, like, you know, it skyrockets. Like they're just more aggressive. Uh, you don't really have a pitch to like for them to say, oh, okay, I, I feel comfortable with where he's at right now. You know, like it's, I need him out like quickly. You know? It's a lot of pressure, man. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so being – where was I going with this? What, what were you – you're a fastball changeup guy, fastball changeup slider? Uh, fastball slider changeup, yeah. Change but up. Ra- rarely changeup. Yeah, that was only like if I was really not feeling uh, – it was more of a pitch to lefties if I really wasn't feeling uh, the slider that day. And then with the, with the windup, did you so – se- so when you push off the rubber and you got airborne, you are pushing off the dirt a second time? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Just, that was just my foot like coming down and then going into rotation. Yeah. Cause it looks like you're pushing off a second time in like, yeah. In like, like five frames a second or yeah. like 5,000 frames a second. Yes. But yeah, it's, you couldn't, there's no way you could physically like push off, push, push off again. Like, like you just can't, it's just happens too quick. It's, I love how it just came out of like saving your arm. Like there, <laughs> like it's such a, it's, it's a cool way. It's a unique way to say like for people that are having arm issues, would you ever teach this to pitchers that have had arm issues? Or is uh, no, like, because they, they definitely made that illegal. So, right. They did, oh yeah, they did. I totally forgot. Did they do that after you got, after you retired? No, no, they did that. Uh, but while I was still playing. Yeah. So did you have to rechange your windup and everything again? Uh, yeah, yeah, and I just wasn't able to do it. Yeah, they, they notified me, like, in spring training in 2017. Uh, so, yeah, I just had, like, two weeks to prepare for the season. That, that's so weird that they they love to change, like, the goofy things. Like, with Pat Bandette, like, how he yeah. has that role that he has to signify what Chandy's he's going to throw with. Yeah. Another Mariner. Gosh, Mar- the Mariners just love getting unique players. Yeah. Um. What, so you were in, I'm going to try to, San Diego, Miami, Seattle. Yeah. Am I missing somewhere? No, no. Nope, those okay. Three. What, where was your favorite place, f- favorite team to play for? Like, because you're kind uh, of all yeah. over. You're in the Northwest, you're in California, then you're in Miami. Yeah, I think I like the, uh, I like the National League just for like the, uh, like the intricacy of the pitcher hitting. I thought it was neat. Like just having like, it was a completely different situation. Like I'd have to get up sometimes when, you know, uh, the pitcher spots coming up, not because the pitcher was doing bad, but just because the spot was coming up. And if, you know, there's an RBI opportunity up out there, like I need to be ready because they're going to pinch hit for him. So I, I just thought that that part was definitely more gameplay than like the American league where it's just like, go out there and hit a home run or like, you know, like we're not going to bunt, like we're not going to hit and run. Like we're going to like hit doubles and home runs. Uh, So so it was just kind of interesting there. But uh, so, I mean, I really enjoyed Miami, Uh, but uh, I I like, I like all of them, honestly, like San Diego is obviously like amazing city and Seattle was my first, you know, opportunity and a great city. So it's, I couldn't like pick one by any means. They're all great ballparks, except when you're in Miami, it was that terrible green set awful green and had the fat the fountain was still there too right oh yeah yeah the uh, sculpture yeah, yeah the that thing's brutal i'm happy jeter <laughs> got rid of that that was I, I it's a beautiful stadium just the lime green like it, it was sore on the eyes when you're trying to watch it on tv um go why am i i'm struggling today um so when you go in with in the national league with uh COVID and everything how we have dh on both sides do you want the national league to have have a lot have pitcher have you know what i'm trying to say 
Yeah, uh, if I want to have uh, at bats. No, I mean, yeah. uh, I think as far as the fans go, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, you pay good hard-earned money to see the best athletes in the world. Like, do you really want to see a guy who is doing like not is not a very good hitter to go hit? Like, if you want like comedy, like absolutely, <laughs> like continue to do it. But as far as like, are you seeing the best athletes in the world hit? No, you're not. Like, you're just not. Like, I, I, like even the best pit hitting pitchers, like our Lorenzen or somebody, like, they're still bad hitters. Like, they're still well below league average major league hitters. Like, you, it's just the sport specificity is so much higher when you have hitters hitting and pitchers pitching. I mean, from that sense, like, I totally understand the fact that, hey, we should have Universal DH, but I also understand, like, if you enjoy the gameplay and the, you know, intrinsic value of having guys, you know, like have to do the little small ball, like I can see the value of having the DH, but at the same time, when we're in a game going more towards strikeouts and velocity and stuff, uh, I, I can see, like, I, I can see definitely going to a universe DH full time. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't like it cause it's changing baseball. I'm very much yeah. in a bowl. Yeah, I'm young, but I'm an old head with it. Like, I don't like. You like to see a bunt. You like. I like to see a bunt. I like that. There's two separate leagues. Like Uh, that. You have the American League. You have the National League. There's different baseball. You know, the American League. It's home runs, RBI. It's high scoring, and the National League. You're gonna see bunts. You're gonna see hit and runs. You don't. I guess my, my my rebuttal to that would what would happen if you saw. Clayton Kershaw or whoever your National League favorite pitcher is, Clayton Kershaw will say, go up to a, uh, taking that bat and break his hand hitting. Like, would you feel bad that he missed the rest of the season? Or would you be like, you know, it was worth it to see him, you know, flail at a ball? I mean, that's I, – I feel bad that, like, to him personally <laughs> that he broke his hand. Um, yeah. It's part of the game. You're going to get hurt. It's, like, another thing that popped in my head, which is, but like, that's, But now shitty. think about, like, his age. So you're taking off a year of his career. Yeah. That could be a career-ending injury for a guy, you know, older guy. Like, that's is, true. That, is that risk-reward worth it? No. To me, it's not. Uh, like like I said, like, we get – I've probably taken – three rounds of batting practice uh, as a national league pitcher. So like, like keep that in mind too. Like you're also like, I, they don't like go out and throw soft toss to me before I go out and hit. Like they're like, Hey, here's a bat. Like we need you to go out and pitch the next inning. Try not to get hurt. Like that's what they're handing me the bat when they're saying that. Like, you wouldn't have a bat in that situation. Or you have to no, borrow somebody. <laughs> no, like I had to go like borrow somebody. Like I, I borrowed Justin Bohr's bat for my two at bats that I had. Yeah, I was like, "Hey, can I borrow your your bat? I don't have a bat." Yeah, he's a big boy. Yeah, is it big bat? What, what is it? What is he swinging? Like a thirty four? Uh, yeah, it was like a thirty four, thirty one. Yeah. Okay, and he's in um he's in Japan this year, right? Uh, either Japan or Korea. Okay, yeah. that that was fun. Did you get to watch any of the KBO on ESPN this year at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I watched like the highlights and stuff. I didn't like get to watch any games because they were like at ridiculous times. But yeah, no, I. Uh, Definitely enjoyed seeing those guys. It kind of sucks that, like, they kind of, you know, have gone away from showing those. Cause I, I thought they were interesting seeing guys over there play. And some of them, like, guys I'd played with, was like, oh, man, it's good to see you still playing or whatever. Different baseball. Um, Would you ever go overseas, like, if you weren't retired? Like, did you ever think about going in Japan or Korea? Uh, yeah, for me, I didn't really think about it as much. Like, I w- definitely would have gone. But, like, just with the rule change, it was like, I'm not going to be able to pitch over there either. So, I'm just going to get all the way over there, and then they're going to call a bunch of balls, and I'm going to have to leave. So, I was like, not really worth it. <laughs> yeah. That sucks. So, was the rule change really what made you retire? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just couldn't, like, go out and pitch. Like, I couldn't go back to what I had done because I had done, done the new way for, like, you know, a couple years at that point. So, I was like – I just couldn't get out of that, like, programmed habit that I had put myself in, you know. That mentality. Yeah. Um, and, like, the, all that muscle movement. Yeah, that, that's brutal. That, that really sucks that that ruined your career. Thank you, MOB. Yeah. Um, <laughs> give me another reason not to like the commissioner. <laughs> Don't get me started on that one. Um, so, with Driveline, what is Driveline exactly to the people that don't know all the analytics stuff in baseball? 
Yeah, it's like uh, just a really data-driven player development company. So basically what they're doing is they're like, you know, all the time gathering data on, you know, major league guys, independent league guys and amateurs. And we're like coming up, you know, with like, like normal, like movement patterns for that. And then kind of programming, like we're coming up with like different programming. So we do like a lot of uh, overload, underload principle. So that would be like any, any like sport does that. Like, you know, javelin guys, like who throw whatever weight javelin, they throw heavier javelins, they throw lighter javelins just to kind of like go for different stimulus. Uh, so that's kind of what driveline does. They're using overload, underload principle, as well as a lot of data to help players get better and player development. And do you guys work with youth all the way up to the professional level? Uh, yeah. Yeah. We work with, like, I got, I had personally have a few athletes who are like 16 right now. Uh, I have, I mean, I have some major league guys too, but I have like, you know, 16, 17, 20 year old guys, college guys. Uh, and then like all the way up. So yeah, it's just kind of whoever is, has the least amount of athletes. Like when an athlete comes in, it's like, okay, yep. You got Joe Schmo and whatever. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so- and like, are those 16 year olds, are they like top college prospects or some of them just trying to make it like onto their varsity team? Yeah, some of them are like, you know, your blue chip, like premier, like college guys. And then some of them are like, I just want to play like varsity baseball, you know, and, and, and anywhere in between. So it's definitely like a, uh, it's not just a one size fits all. Like, you know, we're, we're only dealing with like top end athletes. Like we deal with some guys who, do, to be honest, like don't move very well. And we're trying to make them move better on the mound. That has to be a little difficult. Yeah um and do you guys are able to do it all online so you can reach people all over the country or is it really just focused up in kent uh no no so we have like an online section and we have like an in-person section and you know for like the best results or whatever like you would come in and we would do like the little marker lab right so that's like the little electrodes are all over you the little sensors and you throw in front of these like 30 cameras that are really slow-mo and it basically like recreate your skeleton and shows us how you're moving. Uh, so that would be like ideal scenario. We have that. And, but not where we have like guys that just do online training and never come in. And we, you know, just try and program them to the best of the abilities more. That would be more old school. Like, okay, I see this, like it's not as data driven, but then like, like I said, some guys come in, they'll do the mocap and they'll go back to online training. And then now those online trainers have, like all the data saying, Hey, yeah. So you're not getting scap retraction or you have zero hip shoulder separation. That's why you're throwing max effort, but it's just not coming out very well or whatever. See, I wish I was around when like we were growing up, like that would have been so interesting to see for me, for like me, like in general, like I didn't put a lot on my shoulder. It was, I was an all arm guy and I still was hitting like high, like high eighties, low nineties. I don't want to like get wrong and exaggerate. And then people call me out that like watch this stuff played high school with me. But that was the thing. Like, I don't think I used my legs as much as I should have, which is probably why I hurt my arm. And do you have, have to like completely reboot some of these guys who have been doing it a certain way their entire life. And then you're like, yeah, that's not going to work for us anymore or work for you. Uh, Yeah. So it's kind of like this survivorship bias, right? So like if you get an older guy, like he's probably moves pretty well because he had to move well to continue to be playing when he's 25, 30 years old. Whereas you have this younger guy who's like, yeah, he can play right now because like he's not playing against like stiff competition, but as the competition gets better, he's going to kind of fall off unless we help him move better and get the velocity up or, you know, help movement patterns that are going to kind of be, keep him away from injury. So yeah, it's kind of this like sliding scale of survivorship bias where as a guy, like an older guy just probably has better mechanics because he had to have better mechanics to get to the level and continue to play for longer. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes sense. And like, as working as an independent company, do you guys ever run into issues with co- other coaches? Like if you're dealing with a college athlete and their pitching coach doesn't like what you're doing, like how does that work? Or like a high school where you have that coach that's telling them one way and it's contradicting what you're trying to teach them. Yeah, so I, I can't speak for the other trainers, but as far as I'm concerned, like I, I'm like, hey, so you're leaving today or whatever and we're doing your motion capture. Like I'm going to go over your biomechanics report with you. Like if you have somebody who is going to be coaching you or whatever, 
like I want you to send them the same link that I'm going to send you so we can do a zoom call. That way we're all on the same page. That way there's no confusion. Like that way, if they have questions, they can ask me or if the athlete has questions, they can ask me that way. It's like, uh, and that's for like guys that are go- not going into online, like the online trainers are a kind of a good segue because you know, they're still in the driveline like program, but for like, for guys that aren't going into online program, it's like, I want as clean a transition as I can get. Cause I, I want you to retain all the information I gave you, but also like kind of educate the coach a little bit as well and kind of send you on your way out. And I want you to do good. Like that, that, like that's my bottom line. Like, I don't really care how, like if he comes up with this, you know, crazy drill that, you know, helps you out, like that's perfect. But you know, like that might be n- not realistic for every player. Right. So right. Like, I'm you off with a information packet that is how you move and things that you can improve on go do that. So yeah, that, that's kind of my, my personal philosophy on okay. it. And, and we, we generally do that like throughout. But. And do you guys also, I was seeing, I was looking online, going through the website. Uh, I don't want to learn too much because I like learning it while I'm talking to you. So I can ask like good follow-up questions. Do you guys also teach your method to coaches so they can coach everybody? So it's not just players coming in so like it's kind of getting spread everywhere so the driveline method is going through all of baseball yeah yeah so it's uh definitely we have a lot of continued education like stuff for like coaches and like parents anybody who wants to like learn uh so it's not and it's not just like driveline program weighted balls or anything like that it's like hey like foundations in the pitching like this is what good throwers do these are the movements they're good at if you want to be a good thrower, you probably need to slightly emulate some of the things that they're doing, like uh, lead leg block, uh, hip shoulder separation, scap retraction, uh, just like center of mass. Like these things like, you know, correlate to velocity uh, through our studies that we do internally and abroad. And like, this is a proven track record. Like and here then, it is. Um, the, the big name I can think of, like we spoke before, before we started recording, is Trevor Bauer. How has going to driveline changed Trevor Bauer's career? Because it seems like he's just getting better and better. Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of that, uh, I mean, he's already a good athlete, right? Like, I mean, right. he was throwing really hard in college. It's not like driveline made him this unbelievable athlete. Like, that was God-given. Like, he's already, he already is. But I, I think uh, if you look at his arsenal – like his pitch arsenal, right? So like he has a slider that moves significantly uh, glove side, right? He has a good lift on his fastball, good vertical break. He has a, like probably one of the best curveballs in the league, uh, like with negative vertical break, like he has a good change up. Like his arsenal is designed, you know, like pitch design to be very spread out. So like they all have very distinct different movement patterns, right? So he doesn't have to be as fine with his fastball and he doesn't have to be as fine with this slider. Like it had, like they're all individually great pitches that, you know, kind of cluster in different movement plots. So like if you were looking at like an X, Y coordinate, right? His fastball would be upper right, right quadrant. His slider would be like on the Y X or yeah, on the X axis significantly like, to the left hand side. Like his curveball would be on the y axis significantly down and his change up would be like in between all those, like uh to the right hand side in that top quadrant as well. You know what I mean? Like they would like it's like a, a shotgun spray uh pattern, but it, they're all in different clusters. Yeah. This is blowing <laughs> my mind like just how much you guys are changing the way people are thinking about baseball. Have you has driveline they probably have with the analytics and everything ran into some issues with like the older mentality of how things have been done for the last 50, 60, 70 years. Oh yeah. It's definitely changing the game. Yeah. Definitely. Sometimes like beating your head against the wall. Like uh, just like, cause like some of the old like coaching methods, like I I personally like bought into and tried like in my career. And then I see like how they don't necessarily work or they do like have some truth or they're, they're very correct. Like, and, and it's all along the spectrum. Right. But like, so like what we used to say is like, oh, wow, that fastball had like a lot of ride through the zone. Like that fast, it just seemed like it rose, uh, but it does, doesn't rise. It just drops less than average pitches for that speed. So it has, you know, above average vertical break on okay. the fastball. Like, so like we're both saying the same thing, like old school and new school, but how we're saying it's very different. 
And like physics, you know, kind of leans towards the new school and that like a fastball cannot rise, right? Like you right. can't throw a ball and it, like physically take off, right? Like it is declining the whole way. It just, if it has, you know, high spin efficiency, high spin rate, a good spin direction, it drops less than the guy beside you who throws a very similar fastball. I swear to God, sometimes on TV, it looks like that ball goes like that. <laughs> like, yeah, all this yeah. Chapman's fastball looks like it rises. Like it's, it's nuts. And especially like nowadays, as we're seeing guys throw harder and having more like stuff, like some of these guys that, that their sinkers drop six inches. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And where, yeah, no, and, and that's like, if you look, that would be like short. So there's like, not to like make you too crazy, but there's like short form movement and long form movement. Right. So short form movement is just taking in the account, like the spin direction, spin rate stuff, like things that the pitcher can control. And it's taking those into account. Whereas long form takes all those same things into account, but also adds in the factor of gravity, right? Like, so if you threw a curveball, like, yeah, you created all this spin and it broke, you know, 10 inches in the short form. But in reality, it broke closer to 50 inches because they have, have to add in gravity, right? Like gravity is pulling the ball down towards the ground. Same thing with the fastball. Like the fastball never rises, right? Because gravity is pushing it down the whole way. Like it can't fight that, but it can mitigate that by having really good spin rate and good spin efficiency and riding, you know, through that more so than a guy who throws a sinker, whereas that pitch is designed to, you know, have arm side run and not create that lift, you know. Did you go to college for mathematics? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Environmental science. Yeah, environmental science. Did, did this all blow your mind when you first learned it? Like, I feel – because I, I understand some of the nuances here, but yeah. you're still, like, breaking down, like, things. Like, I understand what you're saying, but at the same time, I'm like, what? Yeah, no, it's definitely, like – like, I've been there for a little over – about a year now, and it's just, right. like, definitely, like, you learn a little something as you go. And, and a lot of it for me, like, since I do have the baseball background, is nice because, like, you know what? I did know that but I just didn't know that was why, or I did know that, but you know, I really would have said that differently, but what you're saying, you know, makes, makes a lot of sense too. You know what I mean? I would have used a lot simpler words. I mean, baseball players aren't necessarily the smartest people sometimes. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, there's definitely a lot of, and dealing with athletes the same way. Like it's very, you can tell if a guy is really getting what you're saying or it's like, you know what, like I need to back it off. Like I need to be a lot less technical and be like, you know, just bend over and like just have better posture right here. Like let's not like go into back extension, like something like super simple, like that he gets that everybody on the planet gets, but it's like, okay, I gave him way too much information and I see the wheels turning and that's going to like hurt the finished product. Yeah. I was definitely that guy, like break it down Barney style (laughs) for me, like make it sweet and simple. And then you have guys like uh, Trevor Bowers, one of those guys, like they like, like, like very technical cues. Like, oh, I want to rotate my pelvis into foot plant. That way I have a bit more efficient lead leg. That way my femur can, you know, facilitate a faster pelvis rotation. Like that's still a cue. Like the yeah. same thing is like, hey, you need to move faster down the mound. But it's like two completely different, different. athletes, two completely different, like, teaching methods you know but I, mean? I was watching some of the videos and how ha- and and how they were like breaking them down i'm like i don't understand this yeah. and then like how you just say like move down fast to the mound okay i get that i'm gonna push harder off my back foot and rotate my hips a little bit faster am i yeah. correct yeah yeah no, i do it yeah it's like i would just try to explode more off of my left leg since i'm left-handed because my brain can't work like that was always a f- so this is a good question being a coach now and you deal with a lot of lefties and being right-handed. Do you have issues coaching lefties? Uh, no, partly because those guys are really good already at flipping it in their minds. Cause they're right. used to having to go through the world being a left-handed and it's a right-handed dominant world. But like, I definitely do a lot of drills left-handed like okay. just for like visualization. Uh, I would never like, if I threw a ball left-handed, it would probably be honestly like 50 miles an hour, but <laughs> Like I can actually do the drills. I don't have a ball in my hand. I can do the drills pretty left-handed uh, like as an explainer. And I catch myself a lot of time. Like, so we'd have the biomechanic uh, report 
And it's like, all oh, it doesn't matter if you're right-handed or left-handed. It's like all the same degrees, but my like visual cues are different. So I like, if I'm like got a lefty, I'm like, okay, you need to keep that shoulder more towards like first base to keep your trunk closed instead of with a righty. I'm like, oh, you need to keep more third base. And like, and I'll say I'm backwards every now and then. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Dude, I, I just tell kids like, it's like watching a mirror. Like that's how I always learned was like, I'm just, oh, yeah. I'm mirroring whatever you're trying to do. And I feel like that's way easier than like when I have somebody who I had a left-handed coach and he's like showing me this. I'm like, this doesn't make any <laughs> sense. Like what you're trying yeah. to do. Like I need to watch it from the other side. Yeah. Um, stepping away from baseball a bit. What, you, what are your other hobbies? Like you said, hunting, like, what do you, what do you do on your downtime? And how often yeah. are you at the, um, at drive line? Uh, so right now we have like the COVID regulations, and everything. Right. So we're there for way shorter than we normally are. But yeah, we're usually there for, you know, 50, 60, 70 hours a week. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> uh, so I, I usually do a lot of hunting and fishing. Uh, like I said, I got, you know, 50 chickens up there right now. So do a lot of uh, chicken egg farming, but yeah, that's pretty much it. What do you like to hunt? Uh, deer, elk, bear, cougar is usually what I uh, go for every year. Rifle or bow? Uh, bow, yeah geez you're one of those crazy people i've never been hunting but like i like to watch like uh meat eater and stuff and like oh yeah bow hunting's way too much patience uh yeah it's a lot of patience and it's like it's completely different sport right like so like there's old like fred bear he's a famous archer it's like old fred bear quotes like you know when you're rifle hunting like you know you're done once you get inside like once you get to like 200 yards 100 yards like when you're archery hunting like once you get to 100 yards like the hunt start like actually starting you know like because then you got to close the distance you know and yeah it's definitely a different sport and like i said you gotta have it's the same thing as like a reliever like in baseball like you gotta have a little something wrong with you like to like want to make th- life harder and like to be like uh, like i've walked out like there's you know 400 500 pound black bear and i have like a bow in my hand it's like well great like like if this, like, if I startled it, like in a bad situation, my mom and cubs or something, like I'd be in a pretty like tough spot all of a sudden, you know, or, or like uh, uh opening day, I actually went out and saw like a, gosh, probably 150, 180 pound cougar. It's was like, well, I got my bow, but you know, not going to help me out a lot right now. If this cougar decides to start hunting me. <laughs> I was just about to ask, have you ever been like gone hunting on like an off day or early in the morning since like baseball games are played at seven o'clock and you don't have to get there till what one or two yeah uh so no i've uh gone hunting in spring training uh okay. but that's it no because uh there's really no seasons going on right. during, uh, during baseball yeah yeah you never know you never know i mean <laughs> i don't i don't know the hunting seasons like i said i'm not a hunter i find it fascinating it's not something well now that i could do with my disorder but like ever would want to do i don't know i don't like the woods i didn't grow up that way i'm definitely oh, like, like, that would like be a uh, big determining factor yeah <laughs> oh yeah when i joined the army it was the first time i ever went camping at night like oh, that's yeah. not like real camping you know like our army camping you're like sleeping in a foxhole and you're freezing yourself off and i was like yeah i don't think i ever want to go camping again <laughs> oh yeah no my brother's more outdoorsy i i never could get into it and it's weird because i we live up here in the northwest so it's just like one of the best adventure places in the world. Oh yeah, for sure. Like most, most beautiful places in this country. And you're, I'm like, nah, I'm good. I'll go to Portland or something. Like I'm definitely a city guy. <laughs> uh, where was your favorite ballpark to play in? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, obviously like I said, like the home ballparks, but, uh, I, I really like St. Louis. Like, uh, I don't know why I liked it's it so crazy. much. Uh, yeah, it's just really pretty. Um, I, we went, me and my wife went to like the tour, like I don't even drink beer or anything, but like we drank, we went to the uh, Budweiser factory and I thought it was just really cool. Like they had these like Clydesdale horses out front and I was like, oh man, it's really cool. Uh, so I, I thought that was cool. Like it had the Big Mac land out in left field and I went there when Mark McGuire was our hitting coach in okay. San Diego. So that was kind of cool. Like, you know, like you'd see him look up at it. I was like, oh man, I met, he like, you know, really had really fond memories of this place and it was just really uh, I just, I really like St. Louis. I just thought it was a really cool city. Uh, just really clean. Uh, it was very nice. Yeah, no, my stepdad's from St. Louis. So like, he always talks about how great St. Louis is. Yeah. Um, is McGuire as quiet, like as he was in the Sammy Sosa documentary? Uh, yeah, he's very quiet, very, but like, like really like, smart. You know, yeah, he's very smart, very personable, but, like, he is quieter guy. But, like, he also has a good personality. It's not like he's, like, this, like, savant that you can't even talk to or something. Like, no, he's very, like, 
he, he knows what he's talking about, but he's also pretty quiet. Yeah. They made they made him seem um, very interesting in that documentary. They didn't. I don't think put him in the greatest light. Yeah, it's not like he's like aloof or anything like right. that. Like he he's very approachable. Like he definitely he's a very cool guy. Okay. Uh, I also I also had like Barry Bonds as my hitting coach in you know uh, Miami. So I was like I, I've seen like all ends of the spectrum. So I think he's a very normal. Like oh, Barry Mark, Bonds. Mark, 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 Mark was the bench coach actually. So. Is is he still in San Diego? No, where is he? I'm not sure. Yeah, I haven't uh, really kept up. I know they brought in a new manager, so I doubt it. But yeah, and then Barry Bonds, something he's great. I'll say he's the greatest hitter of all time, like power wise. But I, I've heard his personality is questionable. Uh, I won't go into all that, but I did. That's fine. Uh, I did uh, after I got my one hit in the major leagues, and I was batting a, a cool 500. I did tell him that I was hitting uh, better. I was a better hitter than him, so I, I do have that uh, in my, at my resume. Yeah. Uh, who's your favorite teammate of all time? Ooh, uh, in the big leagues or what? Give me big leagues, and then give me any of them. Let's go big leagues, and then give me minors or like or college. I don't know, uh, so I really liked playing with Brad Hand. Uh, okay. Very, very good guy, like just super humble guy. But also, like uh, I played with him in Miami, and like he was scuffling a little bit. Like he like got bounced back and forth between like starter, reliever, whatever. Uh, really didn't have like a good secondary pitch, and then he went and started throwing the slider uh, out of the bullpen, and then just kind of took off. And just seeing like him take off like that was really cool. So I actually got to play with him in Miami. And then again later in San Diego, so that that was uh, cool to kind of see his transition from like, like because basically he got Rule Five uh, by mm-hmm. Miami, and then like just got picked up by San Diego and just took off, and it was just kind of cool to see that transition. He was kind of like a little bit like you almost say like on his last leg, and then all of a sudden you know just turns it around, figures it out, and like just takes off. And I think that kind of got me like into the player development, like wow, they're like like you can really change a guy's life and his career, you know, by just making a few adjustments potentially. I mean, granted he had a ton of talent as well, but yeah. And then uh, I, I really like playing uh, in the minor leagues with uh, Danny Holton. Uh, oh. Very, very good guy. He was a Mariners, like second overall pick the same year I was drafted. I was like, that name sounds really familiar. Uh, yeah. If you're a Mariners fan, I'm sure it sounds very familiar. Yeah. He's uh, just like this Uber prospect that just had a few injuries, but yeah, like we, me and him, but uh go fishing before uh, games all the time in double A uh, at this like clubby's pond in Arkansas, and, right? Uh, in Tennessee, Tennessee. Uh, oh, is that Jackson. before they switched Jackson, Tennessee? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Jackson. Cause yeah. Cause now they're Arkansas travelers, right? Yep. They, yep. I think either last year or the year before just changed to Arkansas. Yeah. Okay. Cause like, cause yeah, Jackson, cause my favorite Mariner who like, I mean, he's still in the big leagues, but Mike Zanino was my guy for the longest time. Yeah. And now and now I'm a big Mitch Haniger guy. It kind of works Mitch and Mitch. Like, I'm definitely – I like Haniger a lot. We'll see. Um, that guy's had some bad luck. Yeah. Yeah, I, and that's a, half of it is just staying healthy. Like, can you stay healthy for, you know, a long enough time to contribute? And it's just well, – Who would ever thought you'd rupture your testicle off a foul ball? Yeah. Like, yeah, what are the odds that's going to happen? And then that leads into, like, your abductor and then a herniated disc, like, just multiple, like, downward things. We'll see. I mean, the Mariners have a really interesting youth movement going on. Um, are you – do you have, like – like you said, like, you always will root for the Mariners. Like, are you a team guy or are you a player guy? Like, when you're rooting for, like – when you're watching a ball game, are you going for the people that you know and you're friends with? Or are you kind of like, oh, I like this team better than this? Yeah, no, it's definitely more like guys I played with or guys like I played against and didn't like or did like or whatever. Uh, I definitely like root for the te- the player more so than the team. I would imagine as I like age and start knowing less guys, uh, I'll r- root for the team more because like I don't have this like, you know, 
I don't know, Brad Hand or AJ Ramos or, you know, whoever, Kyle Seeger. Like, I don't know them. So it's like, I no longer, like, have this person to root for, so I'll, I'll root for the team. Uh, you're know. still in baseball, and you're dealing with younger guys. So you might you might always have a hand in there for a long time. Yeah, that, that is true. Yeah, that is true. Is your goal to stay with Driveline for, like, as long as that keeps going, or do you want to be a pitcher co- pitching coach in an organization? Yeah, I think I definitely would like to be a pitching coach in an organization. I just feel like that's kind of like you're dealing with more of the finished product. And right now I'm kind of like more like assembly line, like trying to like, you know, teach a guy good movements that he can go and pursue. But like I said, I I get like, we get big league guys too. So it's not like I I don't get to work with those guys. So it's kind of, it's fun to work with the finished product. Uh, That's kind of like cheating. Like it's, it's a lot of work to work with guys that like, honestly, they, they don't necessarily come in moving well like to understand like hey if you want to throw hard this is these are the movements you kind of have to master and these are ways to do it and like i said the old school and new school like they're not like completely separate like i feel like there's a lot of carryover like you know like you still have to have some trunk stack so like you know old school pitching goes like stay back stay back stay back and that's just telling you not to get over your front leg right like like so and that's the trunk stack like you still have to have the trunk stack you know to throw hard because it helps your lead leg and it helps your positioning and it helps get hip shoulder separation but like it, it's just i like i like the the new and old school kind of meshing and, and that's kind of what i would like to bring like a little bit of like analytics but also like common sense like i'm not going to sit here and say you need two more degrees of, you know, pelvis angle. Like, no, you need to get your pelvis more open because it will help this. You know what I mean? So so I kind of like meshing the two. That that makes it easier. I kind of like how you hit me with like the big words, and then you kind of yeah. like hit me with like when she said trunk. I'm like, oh, I know exactly what he's talking about. And oh, you, you mean you want to improve your kinematic sequencing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, what the hell is he talking about? Yeah. Uh, do you ever get those guys who come in and they're just throwing hard, but they're doing everything wrong? Because I think there's some um, guys who like I feel like my mechanics were terrible. But for some reason, the ball just came out of my arm. Yeah, no. So what I like to say is like, so like hard throwers, like they either do a bunch of movements, like, you know, average to slightly above average. Okay. Or they do a few things really elitely. And that's where they get all their velocity. But you're not going to have a guy that comes in and throws 95 plus who is like just this awful mover. It's just not going to happen. They're doing something well because you have to do a lot. Like there's a lot going on in the pitching motion. Like. Right have to do something well to capture all that energy at some point. So they, they are doing something good. They might not, they might be doing one thing extremely, extremely well, like top 1% of the world. And then the other, you know, five, seven aspects of the throw, like really bad or average, but they're not going to come in and just be like this awful mover. And when, we, and when you're saying movement, are we talking about like flexibility or how they push off their, their back leg to the front leg to opening everything up to how like their arm can go back mine doesn't do that anymore like the flexibility of the arm and shoulder like when you say movement are we talking about all those parts like i'm kind of like yes (laughs) (laughs) yeah so everything yeah so like uh a lot of times we'll put a guy on the table you know like uh, a pt table and we'll take his measurements you know and then how do you move in the mocap right like how do you move under stress and the actual throw like do those numbers match up do you do something like really horribly uh like off the mound that you don't show in like your pt assessment like what is causing the issue and it's like one of those things like you look for the biggest like especially with like athletes that don't move well like i said you're looking for the thing that they do just awful that you can improve like and then like we kind of work up the chain like if they're doing something like not like optimal but like it's passable for now like i won't even hit on that like till you know a month later because like these are like very important issues right now and like you kind of like triage it i guess uh like if you're in a hospital or like in the military like you kind of triage it right like this is a serious issue right now like if you continue to do this, like you are like at an injury risk or you like will continue to like throw 50 miles an hour. Like, but if we can clean this up, you know, maybe things start happening up the chain that kind of, you know. See, I wish that was around like for my brother. My brother's six four, 
lefty like me, <laughs> but he couldn't break 80 miles an hour. Yeah. And everybody was confused because I'm six foot. Like, I'm just at six foot. I say six one, but, like, I'm right there. And I, <laughs> and I had it, and it was always very – because he was always a pitcher. Always wanted to be a pitcher. That's all he wanted to do. Yeah. But, like, he had this – like, he threw good junk. I didn't know what junk was because I just threw hard. And that's, like, now I'm thinking about it. I'm like, oh, that makes sense, like, some of that stuff. And he's very – he would like this kind of stuff, especially when he was playing baseball, because he's very much more like a Trevor Bauer, wants to know about, like, why is this happening when I do this? Yeah. That's how he is with golf. And I'm the opposite. I just want to go there and see how hard I can throw. Like, that's yeah, how yeah. I am with golf. Like, I just sit up there, and I want to see how far I can hit the ball. I don't – if it goes straight, like, I figure out, all right, that's why it goes straight. Now I can do that. But I'm more brute strength, and he's more – Yeah, and, and that's, like, the two types of athletes we deal with, right? Like – give me the end, like, and then give me like, okay, I want to know every step of the way. Like, I want to know why this is happening like this. And and generally I would say like, if it was 50, 50, I'd say like, you know, 60% of our guys like are very technical and that's what they like about driveline is the data driven approach. And then I'd say, you know, 40% say, listen, I don't throw very hard, make me throw harder. And okay. like, and, and, and I would say it's probably, you know, 60, 40 split. Like, we, we have a lot of guys that have like a lot of competency already. And, and, but we also do a lot of like, Hey, before you even come in, like you need to look at this video, this video, and this video of us explaining what we're going to talk about and like what are important, important movements and throw, you know, like that way you have this base understanding. Cause if you got have this guy come in and you have to like completely teach him everything, it kind of takes away from some training time that we could be doing, you know? How does day like day one go? Like I show up, and, like I set an appointment and up with driveline. Like what would the, how does the intake process go? Yeah. So day one, you would basically check in. Uh, you, it'd probably be earlier in the morning cause you would go over to do your motion capture. Uh, then you would have like, you'd meet a throwing trainer and they would take you through our warm up, and that would make sure like you were, you know, hot, ready to do this motion capture. Cause it's like, you know, eight fastballs, like, like max effort fastballs, but like we want good reads. We want like you moving at a hundred percent. Like I don't, I don't need to see, you know, a 30% effort throw like thanks. But like that doesn't tell me how you move off the mound when a batter's in there. Like, so I need to see, you know, hundred percent effort for like eight throws. We'll average them together. And then that's what your mechanics are. And then now we'll work from there. Uh, so yeah. So you're going to come in, meet your throwing trainer. Hey, take me through the, the warm up. Perfect. I'm going to go get the little markers put all over me. I think it's like 20 markers. Uh, and then you're going to do your eight throws and then you're done for the day. Uh, okay. other than your recovery protocol. And then you come in the next day, do a recovery day. The third day, do like a hybrid day. And then you would get like your strength assessment and your PT assessment that day. Fourth day is another recovery day. Fifth day, you're going to get off the mound again in front of rap soda and a radar gun. And we're going to see like what your stuff looks like. Uh, and then we're going to also go over your, your mocap that day and be like, Hey, this is how you're moving. These are some areas you can improve. These are some areas you do really well. Like what, what do you want to do? Like, what is your end goal? Like, what is your approach? Like, when do you need to throw again? And then we make this plan from there. His headphones are driving me nuts. Um, <laughs> the, Cause I, I, I suppose driveline has a pretty particular price to it. Do you guys do anything scholarships for, lower income athletes? Uh, no, actually, I don't think so. That's actually a really good idea. Uh, yeah, I, not to my knowledge. Uh, I know that we like a lot of like some of the pro guys come in and they basically work in the warehouse and stuff and end up, you know, getting training for a slightly discounted cost. But right. I, yeah, that's actually a really good, like I, I would like to do something like an inner city, like team or something. Well, that, even like small, like even country cities, like anything, because um, I think that's where we're seeing this big disadvantage right now. Oh, inner yeah. city or like small rural town cities, you have talent, but they don't get to play AAU or they don't get to play on the big summer circuits and they're getting oh, missed. Yeah. And I yeah. think, I think that's a big thing for me. Like, I mean, I was a kid that got to play in the suburbs and all that stuff. But like my parents never went and paid for the extra stuff. Cause that was brand new. And you know, 10 years ago, nobody thought about that. You just went and played Legion yeah. ball. 
Yeah, no, I, I think that's like a really good point. Like a lot, like to me, like, and I like what driveline does as far as like putting like, like I, and I personally on my Twitter and stuff, like I try to put out like, like it's free information. Like I don't want you right. to pay for it. Like you don't need to follow me to get it. Like this is information, like please use it because like the internet's like the great like equalizer, right? Like it, if you have access to the internet, like you can find a lot of information that you might not have been, you know, privileged to a while back. And then that's kind of like what I want to do. Like, Hey, like here's the information. If you're a good athlete, like take this information, please apply it. If you can, if not, like go to the next thing and try that. Like, like I want you to be a really good baseball player. Like I want you to be a really good football player, whatever sport you play. Like I want you to go be really good at it. Like I don't really care how it happens. I don't care if it's with me or whoever, but like, here's the information. Here's what good movers do. Like apply it as you will. You know what I mean? And and I, I think, I think we need more of that. Just like, free education like hey this is this is a free resource like i'm not asking for any money like like go out there and be it'd be great you know well and the game's free as well like i think people forget about that i mean yeah well i mean you have to pay to play but like at the same (laughs) time i mean it's it's the greatest game it's the most simple game in the world all you need is a stick and a ball i mean look at that old bull durham quote you throw the ball you catch the ball you hit the the ball yeah I was that that goes in. I do. I asked you some of the rapid fire questions already, but towards the end, we do. We're about there towards the do some rapid fire questions. So I'm going to ask you. Well, I I asked you like three or uh, like two or three of them. So I'm going to give you like four rapid fire questions. First thing that pops your head. Are you drinking a Moscow Mule? Uh, no, it's actually a Moscow Mule cup, but it's whatever um, miscellaneous alcohol was left over. It's definitely like a COVID drink. It's definitely. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's a little bit of rum. Uh, it might even be like some peach schnapps or something. I, I don't know. It, it's it's not great, but it's just like any alcohol. Like the more you drink, the better it gets. So. Oh, man. I, I don't drink anymore, but before I got sick, I was a bartender. So I'm seeing like the, oh, yeah. the copper cup the entire yeah, time. And I'm like, a, a copper mule and everything. It's Those no. are the most popular. So I've been out of the scene for about two years when like – my brain disorder and my brain disorder is all off a concussion. So I've had uh-huh. plenty of, plenty of those. And like, I, I don't move well Just talking about movement this entire yeah. time. I don't move well. And like, I have a bunch of other things, but um, I worked at a bar where we didn't have the copper mugs cause they get stolen <laughs> so often. Oh yeah. I'm sure. Oh, I'm they sure. get stolen all the time. They're expensive. They're like 15 bucks a mug. Yeah, they're not uh, – you're not going to, like, misplace it very often for, like, man, screw this. Like, I, I'm going to keep track of this thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. So, what's your favorite food? Uh, probably steak, yeah. What kind of steak? Uh, I'd do, like, a ribeye, like, medium. All right, all right. M- medium, not medium rare? Uh, no, uh, okay. medium rare is getting a little – I, I always, like, if I go to, like, a nice restaurant, like, I've been to a few, like – if you get medium, like, and it's a little undercooked, hey, you're fine. If you get medium and it's a little overcooked, hey, you're good. But you've like been to you, a few nice restaurants, you're in the show, man. You've been to yeah. plenty of good nice restaurants. Yeah. But I was like, honestly, like medium, like if you're a really good restaurant, you're not gonna mess it up like that to, to the point where I can't eat it or I right. can't enjoy it, right? Like so it's like, yeah, just do medium. Yeah, it's not like going to like Applebee's and you know like you're getting your steak one of two ways like burnt or like yeah. undercooked yeah. um who was the when you got called up to the show who is your guy who kind of put you under the your their wing and like taught you about the show because it's it's two different worlds from what I've learned like minor uh, league and then the show is it, it's completely different yeah so I think there's probably two different guys uh Tom Wilhelmson from the Mariners okay. and uh Josh Kinney from the Mariners as well uh, and, and it was basically just like, I was like 21 when I first got called it. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. Like I had been, I, I got on my first plane flight in 2011 and in 2012 I was in the big league. So like, I didn't know like how to do life as well as like baseball, like at a high level. So it was like, and also I'd been, I'd been pitching for like three years at that point. So it was like, I, I had just had a lot happen in a really short amount of time. So those guys were just kind of like, Hey, like settle down. I remember like one time I blew a hold for Tom who was going to come in and get the save. And like, he was like super, like, I was like scared to like approach him after the game. He's like, man, I really messed that up. You know, I'm sorry. I like blew your like save opportunity. And he was like, Oh no, you're fine, man. And he was like, you know, went and like put food on my plate or something for me, like after spread after the game, like just something like super simple, but it was like very thoughtful. And it was like, Oh wow. You know, like 
these guys aren't like these big, you know, characters you see like on, on TV. They're like, they're like people too. They're just like really oh. like talented, like people that perform at a high level consistently. You know and I mean? like Wilhelmson, like I remember be like watching him. He had like one of the cool intros, like he was ready to go. He seemed very intimidating when he wanted to pitch. Also a bartender. For, oh, yeah. really? That's awesome. Oh, yeah. They called him the bartender. Yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't for a theater. while in uh, Arizona. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Because you were – were you there with Ryan Roland Smith? You had to be. Uh, no, no, no. He was, uh, he was before. He was here before Roger. I, I've met met him, but it wasn't as he a player. He seems like a cool guy. Because I – in 2009, I had the season tickets to Portland Beavers. So, I got to see him when Tacoma came quite often. And he, he always looks so cool with those Oakley glasses on and everything. And they talk like he's from Australia. <laughs> Yeah, hey, I get to see him. I get to see him in Mariners post and pregames all the time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Carter, I love you, man. Uh, who's your favorite all-time baseball player? Ooh, uh, so I grew up being a catcher. I really liked uh, Jorge Posada. Uh, okay. I don't know why. You should, like, no matter where you are in the country, like you always see the Yes Network, so you always see Yankees games. Uh, so I just saw a lot of these Yankees games, and I was a catcher, and I was like, oh wow, like I really like. Jorge Posada. So I, I always grew up watching him. But like as far as like pitchers, uh, I, I he, he's like maybe a little older, maybe a year older than me. But uh, Craig Kimbrell, uh, I always like watching. Talk him. about a good beard. Oh yeah, yeah. He was always like you know like a guy that was like man, wow. Like he throws like a, I, I, at the time I threw like this spike curveball and he threw a spike curveball and like had a good fast. I was like oh wow like. He's quite a bit shorter than me. Yeah, his, but like, like knuckle curve. Yeah, How tall like, are you? Six four? Six five, yeah. Six five. Jeez. Yeah, I was like, man, I I I really would like to like have success like him, you know. I mean it's so funny with baseball. You have guys who are six five and then you have like Tim Lincecum who's five eleven and through heat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um yeah. already asked favorite ballpark. What's your favorite beverage? Because I it used to be beer or wine, but like a lot of we talked to you, so, like, our first interview ever, you'll know, uh, was um, Dave Smith. No, not Dave. Oh. Dave Sims. Why did I say Dave Smith? Oh, okay. Yeah, the Dave Mariners. Yeah. yeah. So, and that was, that's – I've told this story, and so everybody who watches this, not everybody, like, the ten people that watch this are going to be like, come on. I just messaged him, and he's like, yeah, sure, but I have to kind of do it today. And I was like, oh, okay. That was a cool thing because I've been a Mariners fan the last 14 years. I've basically fallen asleep to him because you don't always stay up through – the Mariners debacles. Yeah, for sure. Oh, sorry. Well, sorry. What was the question? Uh, um, what was your favorite beverage? I, I like go on tangents. I'm sorry. Uh, so I uh, actually met uh, one of our trainers in San Diego had a brother who was a sommelier. Okay. So he's like this big time, oh, not to be, not to be confused with the Somali pirates, Somal, Somali pirates, <laughs> uh, but he's a sommelier and uh, he, recommended this red uh wine that's like aged in a bourbon barrel it's called uh cooper and thief uh and i really like it it's uh like it's more like a like dessert wine it's a little like richer but it, it, i i think it's really good nice are you like a soda sweet tea guy like what are you like throughout the day uh just water yeah water all right yeah. Pff, it's boring athletes the, with their shit. like great Maybe. diets yeah. Come on. <laughs> um favorite ball game food Oh, uh, like as a player or? No, like as a fan or player, like have you ever like been in a game and like for like I want a hot dog and like had like the clubby go buy you a Mariner dog or something? No, no, that would be super unprofessional. No, I. <laughs> I've heard stories like weird stuff like that. So I've always wondered. Yeah, those guys also like are like 15 year veterans. Uh, yeah, no, I'd say probably like a good, like you can't beat a good popcorn. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, the, one of my favorite, like, watching, like, moments was Prince Fielder eating nachos. Did you, have oh, you seen it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, from, yeah just took yeah, it from the fan. Yeah. Uh, who's you, who is your favorite hitter to face and your least favorite hitter to face? Who is somebody uh, who rocked you and somebody who you, you knew he was coming up? You're like, ha, this is easy. Uh, so those, those are very different questions. So my favorite hitter to face was Mike Trout. I just, like – it was like okay. right when he was coming on the scene, kind of like it was like 2012, 2013. We were in, both in the AL West. Like I just got to face him a lot because I was a right-handed reliever and, you know, he's a right-handed hitter. So I, I liked facing him the most. He's right there. Uh, I have a ticket stuff from his rookie season. Oh, yeah. yeah. So when was that? 2009. Uh, 2009. 
so his rookie season, well, his baseball and and um, what is the uh, time service time, you know, messes. So his rookie season was 2011, but this ticket is his rookie, like his rookie of the year season. 2012 was October 2nd, 2012. Mariners versus Angels. Uh, I've Mariners won like 13 to nothing that day. Oh, oh yeah, I was there. Yeah, yeah. So we were in the same ballpark at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember you there. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not gonna lie. I probably went to the pin and like probably like try to talk to somebody because that's just the guy I am. Uh, but yeah, yeah always yeah, trying. So he would be my favorite. Uh, the guy I felt like I owned or whatever you would yeah. say, uh, Mark Reynolds. Sorry, Mark. Uh, and then a guy. King. Yeah, and then a guy I just could not get out was uh, Scooter Jeanette. I hate that guy. Uh, I hope he gets a flat tire. Four home runs in one game. He has that under his belt. Yeah. And that yeah. guy, that guy. I faced him in Double A. I faced him in the big leagues. I, I don't know that I've ever gotten him out at all in my career. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I hate that guy. <laughs> and then this is the one. This question, I I I judge people on because I think it's an important one. What is your favorite baseball movie? Oh, uh, yeah. I think like Bull Durham would have to be. Yeah, that that's the only answer. Like my second favorite baseball movie is For Love of the Game, and I get a lot of shit for that one. Yeah, that one's like good. It's just a little long winded for me. Like, oh yeah, you know, eventually things work out. Then yeah, he throws, he throws the, perfect the perfect game. But I mean, Bull Durham's just so funny, and it's so baseball esque. Like even when they come and like catcher comes up and talks to the pitcher, like you're just trying to get him like to calm down. Yeah. And also like not to mess with Kevin Costner, but I feel like. As a carpenter, I would not accidentally cut my hand, you know, as I'm splicing a board. I'm sorry, but that's just – like, and your pitching hand. Like, you don't have a glove. You don't have, like, a board to push it through. Like, it's just – it's not realistic in my – like, if it was a chainsaw and he was, like, chopping firewood, that would make more sense. But, you know. And then, and then I had one more just pop up my brain. Who's your favorite battering mate? Your favorite catcher? Oh, uh, I really like Tezu Sucre and okay. and J- well, J T. Real Muto is really good too. Uh, yeah, it would probably be between those two. I I hear J T. is a very quiet guy. Uh, he's quiet, but he's all, he's also like one of those guys that, like will say something really funny too. Like he's not like definitely quiet. Like he, he definitely is a good dude. Uh, that's that's what I've heard. That's what Lane Adams told me because they play yeah. together. Just and uber so. talented, like. Probably the fastest catch, definitely the fastest catcher I've ever met. Dude, he's so fast. Yeah, yeah. He, 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 well, I think he was like a shortstop and then converted like later on in life. So yeah, he definitely, uh, definitely we're carried that athleticism. We're seeing more of that guys getting converted to catcher, like Austin Nola. Like, yeah, he's a yeah, fantastic. I actually played with. He was actually my roommate in uh, the Cape. And I okay. Played, yeah, I played with him and God, would it, would it have been Double A maybe some too? No, no. Yeah, no, I, I definitely know him very well too. Did you play with Phil Hughes at all? And said uh, no, no, no was really. he after? Because like we're big, like me and Abe, Abe's not here. We're big in the hobby community, like we're collectors, and like Phil Hughes is like the king of collecting right now. Like hmm. he's definitely built his platform is now collecting. He got like Matt Strom into it. That's another guy who's been collecting. Yeah, a lot. I know. I play with Matt. Yeah. I, Matt said he'll come on once they're done with their playoff run. So I'm excited for that. And then um, Trevor Plouffe. I'm trying to get Trevor Plouffe on. He said he'll eventually if you would, uh, If you would kindly tell Matt Strom that I'm a better archer than he'll ever be, I would appreciate it. Oh, yeah. I will. I will. I'll yeah. remember that. He'll never outshoot me in archery. Just you make sure you tell Matt. Are you a collector of anything at all? Uh, No. No. <laughs> um, and then I keep like – questions just keep popping my head. How – um. How did you enjoy signing all these baseball cards? Because I know you've signed a few. I uh, actually have your autograph coming on the way. Each time I like buy an auto, like I did this with Lane Adams, like it's like it's telling me it's supposed to come today and it doesn't come, so like I can show it and then like. Yeah, if it doesn't, let me know. I'll send you something. But yeah, no, I I don't like I, I enjoy signing stuff for fans. Like especially now, it's like you know, kind of like a renewed respect. Like oh, like the people appreciated like what I brought to the game or whatever. Like so, it's it's kind of like a cool thing. Like during the like during it, I'm like, why? Are, like because fans will stand behind like you know my catch partner when I'm throwing like a hundred miles an hour. I'm like I'm literally throwing the ball a hundred miles an hour, and I have a rough idea of where I'm throwing it. And it's going to a guy that 
catching is probably like his third or fourth best thing he does. Like, so just think about that when you stand behind this guy that you, that you trust with your life. Cause I'm throwing this ball very hard and very aggressively. Like, just remember that, like, he's not very good at catching and I'm really good at throwing. So like that was the only like qualm I would have with like autograph guys. Like, just don't stand behind the guy I'm throwing at. Like I'm like 90% sure where it's going. Definitely no more than that. I, I never knew where it was going. Sometimes yeah. it went everywhere. <laughs> um, so the floor is yours. Anything you got to promote? Anything you want to let the people know about? No, I just, uh, if guys want to uh, follow me on Twitter, I definitely appreciate it. And like I said, I try to put out, you know, a little bit of new content every week, just like, like educational stuff as far as like, you know, like what does the lead leg block do or what is like scat retraction look like or something like that. Yeah. Words that make no, no sense to me, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyways, everybody, thank you for watching. Remember uh, we do have this thing called hobby heroes going on on Twitter. It's our pinned tweet. Um, if you know somebody in the hobby or in life that does something a little special, a little extra, comment comment in the tweet and let us know. And on Fridays of every week, Gabe and I will be picking somebody. And then on the third, and then three months from that first tweet posted, we're giving away a dugout mug. Um, oh. Have you ever seen one of these? Uh, I've seen them. Yeah. Do you have one? No, I don't have one. You but... gotta get a. You gotta just, just hit them up. They're they're super good on uh, on on Twitter. Like super nice yeah. guys. We have the oh, we have Randall Tom- Thompson coming on on Wednesday, so that's our next interview, which will be oh, very good. Cool. Yeah, because oh, I, I did think of something. I, I did want to thank you for your service. I appreciate oh, you no serving for our country and everything. So I did want to thank you for that. But yeah, no, I I'll definitely uh, look at the the mug thing. They're cool. <laughs> it's weird to drink out of at first because like if you think about it, like I have it my side Hanniger bat like right here, like boom, it's the same size, dude. Oh yeah. Yeah, like, it's definitely, like, you have to think about it at first. They, like, they took, like, the bottom here, turned it into a shot glass. Like, they did some, like, interesting things, which is – it's really cool if you're a big baseball fan because, like, who doesn't like that? Uh, well, everybody, thank you for watching Just Mission. I'm Mitch Mitchie. Thank you, Firecast, for coming on. Everybody have yeah. a good one. Just